You know the story, we call it the prodigal son. You know the story, there's a young man, he's disobedient, he's stubborn, he asks his father for all of his inheritance, and, and his father gives it to him, and this self-centered young man runs long into sin. He goes out and he squanders everything he has. He basically, when he asks his father for this inheritance, he's saying, you're dead to me. I want to go live my own life. I don't care about you anymore. He's a prodigal. That's why we call this the prodigal son. But we may have learned later on in our lives, like I did when I was in seminary, that there's another character in this story. There is an older brother. This is someone who seems as if he is a hard worker. He seems very faithful. We'd like to be like this person, but he doesn't appreciate what he has. Rather, he is discontented. He cares more about his own inheritance, what he will get eventually, than he does about his own brother. He lives in his father's home, and yet he has missed the essence of his father's grace. To understand this parable, you need to understand who Jesus is speaking to. Jesus is speaking to religious leaders, and he has been eating in the home of whom they call sinners. And they are condemning him for this. Jesus, as he hears them complaining about him reaching out to those who are lost, tells three parables. He tells about a lost sheep. You remember that parable about the shepherd who leaves the 99, goes out and finds one. And then he tells the parable about a lost coin, about a woman who has a dowry and she loses one of her coins and she searches and she finds it. And then he tells this parable about this lost son. These are important characters. In many ways, we are like these characters. Sometimes we are like that prodigal who is lost, who is out rebelling against their Heavenly Father. Sometimes we think we are faithful, and yet we don't understand God's complete grace. But the longer I've looked at this story, though these characters get more attention, there's one character here who I think the parable is really about. I would rename this parable the parable of the good father. For the father is central to this story. Just as God is central to all scripture, this parable is telling us something about the good father, our heavenly father. You, you see, the good father is the one who does not force his will upon us. Just like that prodigal son who just wanted to do what he wanted to, the father said, you're free to do that. I'm often asked, why aren't things better in our world? Why, if God is so loving and God is good and God is all-powerful, why is it not a better world? And I usually answer that with one word, freedom. Freedom is something that we celebrate. And yet freedom is something that can lead us into trouble. We can either obey, and we are free to obey what God has told us of God's law and God's word, or we are free to reject God. Yet in rejecting God, it brings consequences to ourselves and to others. It's not so much that God is seeking to punish us as our sins have their own results. Just as this prodigal who went off and squandered everything and then found himself destitute. So too, when we live lives like that, we find ourselves in terrible situations. Just like that older brother who didn't realize God's grace, so he was in the father's house, we too, when we are resentful, find that our resentment leads to ugly lives. And yet that does not mean that God does not love us or does not care for us. Just as his father loved both of those sons, so God loves us and it breaks God's heart when we cannot see God's grace, when we cannot learn from our failures and return unto God. So God gives us this freedom. God, as a good father, says, you are free to live life as you see fit. Though God instructs us, 
though God longs for us to love. I believe it was Mark Twain that says, a boy who carries a cat by the tail can learn something he can't learn in any other way. That's just something that boys do, and, and they find out that's not really a great thing to do. So, too, God lets us do things that aren't that great. Benjamin Franklin said it this way, experience keeps a dear school and fools will learn in no other. Sometimes we are like that prodigal son and yet God in God's love and wisdom allows us to have freedom so that we too when we come to our senses might return to God and choose to live in a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. I have a friend who's a retired pastor. His name's Wayne Hunsucker. And Wayne ministered to families. He especially liked to work with married couples. And Wayne and his wife, Pat, would do marriage enrichment workshops. And one of the things I remember that, that Wayne and Pat used to say is that marriage was a choice. Every day in their life, they would look at each other and they would say this, I choose you. And you might say, well, that, that's obvious. Didn't you, years and years ago when you got married, didn't you choose that person and choose that life? And, and yes, they did. And yet, Wayne and Pat would remind us this morning, if they were here, that each and every day of our lives, we make these choices to choose and to love, to choose one another. Our Heavenly Father does not want us, though he could have forced his love upon us, uh, to just turn to us, to, to him, uh, just out of some compulsion, but rather out of love to say, I choose to be a child of God today. For you see, the good Father, God our Father, has shared all that he has with us. That younger son, when he came and asked his father for everything, the father said, okay. It's yours. Take it and go. Uh, now, that doesn't seem like the smartest thing to me. I mean, if that father had gone and talked to an attorney, the attorney would have said this. What you need to do is this son of yours isn't really trustworthy yet, so you need to set up a trust fund. Here's what you're going to do. Take all you're going to give him, and, and when he turns 18, give him a third of it. He's going to need some money for college, and, and, and he's going to waste that, so give him another third, maybe when he turns about 28, about the time he might get married, and, and then don't give him any more until he's about 48, because he's going to need some money for retirement. Maybe when he's 48, he'll have enough sense to do something with the last third. Have y'all heard those things, those trust funds? Maybe you've set some of those up, and, and they make sense to me, but... The Heavenly Father doesn't do that. God pours out blessings upon blessings upon blessings. You might say, well, I don't see those blessings. I didn't just get everything I wanted, like that younger son. Well, if that's how you feel, you may be more like the older son. We live in God's grace and don't realize it. That older son, he's out working hard and when he comes in he hears this party he is angry he says I'm not coming in there I've worked my whole life I've made everything that my father said and in here uh, here this younger son who's wasted everything who's lived a horrible life gets a party and, and I didn't even get a goat and he got the fatted calf and what does the father do the father says you've missed it you don't understand it. Everything that I have is yours and you have been in my presence all of this time. All of this time. And anything you wanted, you could have had. Jesus told us to pray in his name. And when we get our hearts right, God gives us what it is that we need. I don't know about you, but I feel for this poor father these two sons going in these two different directions, but neither realizing the great love. I, I sometimes wonder if, if the angels in heaven come up to God and say, how long? How long are you going to put up with this? How long are you going to keep trying to love these children of yours, this creation called humans? 
I imagine when Adam and Eve rebelled and disobeyed, uh, the angel said, you going to still put up with that? I imagine when God chose Abram and called him Abraham, they formed a covenant together and they said, we will be your people. And, and pretty soon they broke the covenant and the angels might have said, are you going to put up with that still? I imagine when God gave the law to Moses and said, this is how you should live your lives. And what did the people do? They broke the law immediately. And God still loved. And then Jesus, after God sent prophet after prophet, came to us. Don't you think the angels must wonder that God loves us so much that he would send his very son to take the penalty for our sin. And we are still like these poor children, these two brothers who just don't get it. God is always giving, always loving, always hoping that we will turn back unto God. And he blesses us in so many ways. And, and we miss it. I used to volunteer at Merle Fest every year. Y'all know that little festival that happens that has a lot of bluegrass folks that come it, it was really fun and, and one of the things i liked about merle fest was they have an outreach program to the high schools if if you're in that area uh, merle fest sends a band to your high school and and, and they have a, a party for about half a day the kids get this band and they come and, and i always remember asking my kids what band came to their high school and i remember one day asking my son i said Son, did y'all get a good band today? He said, well, you know, Dad, we, we got these folks. They, there were some kids, Sean Watkins and Sarah Watkins, and this guy playing the mandolin called Chris Tilly. He said, we've never heard of them. We don't know who they are. I, I wish we'd send some good band that was really good, that everybody knows. Well, if you don't recognize those names, that band was called Nickel Creek. No one knew of them then, but then they became one of the most famous bluegrass bands ever and had so many popular songs, and the kids that were listening to them just didn't get it because they hadn't made it yet. Our Heavenly Father is giving us blessing after blessing after blessing, and yet we don't realize God's grace and love. And so Jesus came and walked among us and he tried to love, and folks still didn't get it. There were some who are uh, like that prodigal son who sinned and said, uh, we're just going to do our own thing. There were others, when the prodigals came back, said, uh, how can God love them? There are plenty of these kind of folks out there, and we are like that. And neither one of those paths really work. So what are we going to get out of this parable? Well, look at the Father. What is the Father doing? The Father is watching and waiting in hope. The Father is trying to teach these two sons how to be men. Not going and doing just whatever you want, but by being faithful. Not trying to earn grace that you already have but recognizing the blessings of God to love and to respect. And God is still trying to teach us that same lesson of his great, great love. One of my favorite songs about fathers is a country song by Joe Diffie called Tougher Than Nails. Maybe you've heard it. A little boy walks in with a bloody nose, got beat up on his way home from school again. His dad called him running out the back, Tears in his eyes and a baseball bat, old revenge. He said, son, I won't stop you, but before you go, let me tell you a story about the toughest man I know. You can hit him and he just turns the other cheek. Don't think for a minute, though, he is weak, because in the end he showed them he was anything but frail. They hammered to him, him to a cross, but he was tougher than nails. This is the kind of love that God has for us. That same kind of love that is like this father in this story who when he sees a son who has rejected him coming down the road, he runs to him and he grabs him and he hugs him. And The son has this whole her speech about he just wants to be a servant, 
And the father says, forget that. You are my son. He puts the ring on him again, signifying his sonship. He gives him the coat and he kills the fatted calf. When the other brother comes and, and won't come in, he goes out to him and he employs him to come in. He explains to him about grace and love. This father is trying to teach these two what it means to be a man. It's not some macho image that we have. You see, men come in all shapes and sizes, and men come with different personality traits. But what does it mean to be a father? It means to love. It means to care. It means to give. It means to teach and correct and to keep loving and loving and loving. To be a father means to be the man that you were created to be. To find out that your Heavenly Father loves you and has created you to be who you are. And that that which is best in you is a gift from God that you are to give to your family and your friends and this whole world. God, the good Father, doesn't waste his time trying to prove himself. Trying to be something else. God rather lets God's love flow out to us. His grace, his truth. He chooses to love even his disobedient children. He chooses to love even those children that he has blessed and they don't recognize the blessings. You want to be a good father to your children? Teach them right and wrong, but love them even when they do wrong. Provide for their every need and then love them even when they don't recognize it. Love them. Give them your grace. When I was growing up, there was a friend of our family. She used to come around a good bit and talk to my mom and dad. She was close to my mom, and my dad was her pastor. She had had a hard life. It seemed like she had had poor luck, but really she had made poor choices. She had had multiple marriages. She had had job after job. When she was in her 50s, she had to declare bankruptcy. She ended up living in a nursing home, though she was not old enough, because there was no other place for her, and that's where Medicare placed her. I remember one time, after we went to see her and we were leaving, and I was just a teenager, my dad turned to me and he said, you know, Nelson, most of her problems would simply go away if her father would simply say, I love you, and I'm proud of you. He said to me that day, she doesn't know it because her dad isn't capable of saying that. But I love you, and I'm proud of you. And I always want you to know it. And he said, one of my jobs as a pastor is to make sure that everyone, no matter who their father is, hears those words that I love you and I'm proud of you for you are my beloved child. Those are the words from my father to me and the words I share to you today that God loves you, that God is proud of God's good creation that is in you and that God's arms are open wide to all who will come and live in that love and grace.